All right, period ontology. This is my favorite course um, to teach. It's also my favorite course um, to learn about because perio is our bread and butter. As hygienists, we are always educating our client on periodontal disease. We are debriding to, you know, maintain oral health to avoid um, perio disease. So I love to, uh, teaching periodontology. So let's look at um, what a uh, what, what actually what this term means, periodontology. So Anything that ends in ology is the study of, okay, so ology is the study of, and is the study of the periodontium. So what makes up the periodontium? Well, when we look at the periodontium, the tissues of the periodontium or the things that are surrounding the teeth. So again, sorry, let's go look at the word periodontium. Peri, this word over here, means around. And odont, this word over here, means teeth. So periodontium are the structures that are around the teeth, okay, the structures around the teeth. And what is around the teeth? Or what is around the tooth? The gums, the gingiva, the cementum, the PDLs, and the bone. So these are the components of the periodontium. So here's a question for you. A patient exhibits a bacterial infection of all parts of the periodontium. So all parts of the periodontium, that means all of these, the gingiva, the cementum, the PDL, the alveolar bone was affected. There was a bacterial infection. Which of the following is the state of her periodontium? The answer is D, periodontitis. Periodontitis means that you have bone loss, right? When you think of perio, you think of bone loss. So if all of these are affected, including the bone, then it has to be periodontitis. Now, some of you might say, well, why not periodontal disease? Well, periodontal disease is basically a heading, if you will, and periodontal disease could mean that you have gingivitis. It could also mean that you have um, perio, periodontitis. So it's too vague to say it might be a second best answer, but it's too vague for me just to circle or say periodontal disease is my answer because periodontal disease could mean gingivitis. It could also mean periodontitis. It incorporates both categories. Your best answer is perio in this case because all parts of the periodontium, including the bone, the alveolar bone, is affected. So when we're looking at a healthy uh, mouth, we can see this is very healthy. Uh, we see some stippling. We see, you know, nice tight gums and coral pink color. When we're looking at the gum, okay, uh, what we want to uh, focus on actually right now is the gingiva has uh, many different components. So it has the sulcus. The sulcus is the area where you probe. Your probe hits the sulcus. It has the free gingiva, which is free from the tooth, as you see. It's not stuck on. And it has the attached gingiva, which is fully attached to the um, tooth. We have, um, what, what, this is what the bone looks like, this is what the PDL looks like, and then we also have cementum right here. Alveolar mucosa is right here. So this is the movable tissue. This is um, anything that is movable is non-carotenized. Okay, when I think of non-carotenized, I think of not hard. So alveolar mucosa is non-carotenized. It is not hard. It is movable. You can move it. And so you can see how the alveolar mucosa is smooth, it's shiny, um, and it blends into, um, so it actually, if you look at it in the maxilla, so at the top, it actually blends into the palate. Junctional epithelium. So this is a word that we all need to be very familiar with. The very base of the sulcus, okay, so the very bottom of the sulcus. So if I were to stick a probe in here, let's draw that. So here's my probe. Um, the very bottom of my probe hits the junctional epithelium. Okay, it's, it's the part that is attached. So the tissue, the epithelium that is attached, that's around the tooth. Okay, and sometimes when you have a um, unhealthy mouth, so if you have gingivitis or periodontitis, you're gonna have GCF, which is gingival corvicular fluid. It's a serum-like fluid, and it's uh, secreted from the sulcular space, from the sulcus. So if you have an unhealthy mouth, you're gonna have more GCF. If you have a healthy mouth, you won't have GCF. When we're looking at how the gum should look like, when we're looking at healthy gums, what we want to do is we want to look at um, the color. So if it is a coral pink color, it's not, you know, it's not as vascular, right? So we're looking at the degree of vascularity. Is it very red or is it not red? 
we're looking at um, how thick the epithelium is. We like seeing thick gums. We don't really like seeing thin gums. They're more prone to recession and stuff. So thick gums are better. And the key thing we want to know is that healthy gums, both of these are healthy gums. Now I know this looks like we, you know, we see a lot of recession here and we might think, oh, that's not healthy. Um, but this is stable. This person has a stable mouth because um, they had recession, but now it's stable. The recession isn't going, isn't getting worse. And also there's no bleeding. And that's the number one indicator. Healthy gums do not bleed. Okay, so healthy gums do not bleed, nor do they have pus coming out. So if there's no bleeding, it is considered healthy. In fact, um, one of the things we'll look at is if you have less than 10% of bleeding in your mouth, it is considered a healthy mouth. Less than 10% bleeding is considered a healthy mouth. And we'll look at that as we progress. Let's look at the microscopic anatomy of the gingival epithelium. So the word epithelium, epithelium is just the outside skin, the outside gum. Okay, um, in our body, our skin is the epithelial layer. And then inside is your connective tissue, and this is where your blood supply is. So the outside is your epithelium. And when we're looking at the epithelium, the it is stratified squamous epithelium. Okay, so in the oral cavity, in their mouth, we have stratified, which means layers. So stratified means layered. Squamous means flat. The cells are flat. So if we're looking at the cells on the epithelium side, it is stratified, it is layered, and it is squam uh, squamous, which means it is flat. There are three components of the epithelium. The, we have the oral epithelium, which is on the outside. So if I'm looking at someone's gums, what I'm looking at is the oral epithelium. We have the sulcular epithelium, which is where the sulcus is. So if I'm probing, the side of my probe touches the sulcular epithelium. And then we have our base of the sulcus. So if I'm probing, the bottom or the tip of my probe hits the junctional epithelium. So here's a question. A patient has a healthy periodontium. If the hygienist could see the microscopic structures of this patient's periodontium, how would the interface of the junctional epithelium with the gingival connective tissue appear? Would it be smooth or would it be wavy? So what does this mean? You have a healthy mouth, okay? And you wanna look at the microscopic structure. So see how on one side it's wavy and on one side it's smooth? This is a healthy mouth, okay? In a healthy mouth, it's asking what is the interface of the junctional epithelium? So look at the junctional epithelium. Do you see how it's smooth? So your answer here is smooth. When you have a healthy mouth like this, where you don't see any gums inflammation, you don't see any bone loss, it's healthy. The junctional epithelium is smooth, okay? Smooth interface. If you had an unhealthy mouth, if you had gingivitis or perio, you would see a wavy interface on this side. Periodontal ligament fibers. So we have uh, five different types of periodontal ligament fibers and they're giving it specific names. So alveolar crest fibers, for example, makes sense because this is where your alveolar crest is. The very tip is your crest and that's where the fibers are extending. Um, if you look at horizontal fibers, that makes sense too because they look as if they're just going horizontally. That's horizontal fibers. So these are periodontal ligament fibers and one of the main important things of why or reasons why we have PDLs is to to keep the tooth within the socket. Okay, we want to keep the tooth within the socket. It's also good for nutrient transport, so it will send nutrients to other areas of the tooth, and also pain and pressure. If you feel pain and pressure, it does get transmitted through the PDL. Alveolar bone. So we have um, different types of alveolar bone. We have the ones on the inside, which is cancellous bone, also known as spongy bone, because they look kind of spongy. And then the outside is hard cortical bone, okay? So the outside bone is cortical bone. And then the bone that is just surrounding the tooth socket is your alveolar bone proper. So the bone that's very close to the tooth is your alveolar bone proper. This point over here is saying alveolar crust varies in size and shape depending on tooth position. So if this tooth was extruded up a little bit, the the you know it might the bone might look different. So if you're if it's aligned, the bone will look different. If you see teeth, you know, at different um, of different sizes and different like different areas of where they've erupted, the bone could look a little off. Periodontal assessment instrument. So 
we use many different types of instruments to um, do our perio assessment. So if you remember when you're at school and you're doing perio assessment, we needed light. We needed air so that we can dry the tissue so we can see where the calculus is. We can see what the consistency of the gums um, are. We need a mirror. We need an explorer. We need probe. And we need an FMS if possible or any radiographs. That's what you need. You need radiographs too in order to determine their the client's perio condition. Now, one of the things we need is probe, and there's many different probes, but the one I want to point out to you is this one right here. This is the Marquis probe. It's color-coded probe. And this probe is divided into a three millimeter section. So this right here is three millimeters. Then we go down here. This is six millimeters. This is nine. This is 12. And then we also have like the Williams probe, which is this one right here. And what's the Williams probe is um, was the first type of probe that was actually used for uh, probing depth. And it has, it's in millimeters. So one, two, three, and then there's no four, and it goes to five. So one, two, three, five. And then there's no six, and it jumps to seven, so seven, um, eight, nine, ten. Okay, so many different probes that are out there. This is the WHO probe, and we're going to talk about the WHO probe later on. But one of the periodontal indices is something we're going to look at, and periodontal indices looks at how to use the WHO probe, or the CPITN probe, some people call it. And what's interesting about this, it's also used for PSR. If you remember PSR, periodontal screening and recording, this is the probe that is used for that. It has a ball tip, so that's what's unique about it. It's a 0 0.5 millimeter ball tip, and the reason for this ball tip is to, it actually helps with calculus detection, believe it or not. So this ball tip is there for calculus detection, and it also helps detect, you know, if there's any defective margins, any overhangs, it all be, you know, it can easily be detected with this ball tip, but mainly for calculus detection. All right, so here is a question for you. I'm gonna let you read that and then you and then see what you can come up with. There we go. So pink. No recession, light plaque, and the hygienist says that after a visual inspection, the, the you know patient has a healthy periodontum. Is that correct? No. Even though it looks healthy, we cannot determine their um, status, their perio condition, just by visual inspection. We need to see radiographs. We need to see probing depths. We need to see their cal. So just visual inspection is not enough. So in 2017, um, AAP, which is the American Academy of Periodontology, they developed a new system and they joined with the European um, Committee. And they decided to, they came up with a new system and it was a good thing because they have, um, it's very easy to understand. It is linked. It's just like, you know, someone has cancer and we, we stage them as stage one, two, three, four. So it's just like that. We stage our period stage one, two, three, four. It's easy for insurance purposes. Um, so they've made it easy for us. And so the classification of periodontal disease, which came out in 2017, looks like this. There are four categories, as we see here. And we're going to look at each one of them. So if you're healthy, there's, you know, you could have um, periodontal health. If you have gingival diseases, you could have two types of gingivitis, which we'll look at, or two types of um, gingival diseases. If you have period, there's three types, and then other conditions affecting the periodontium, there's many types. And what's interesting now is now they have an implant. They never used to have an implant uh, category. So now they have a peri-implant category as well. Perio, it used to be called chronic or aggressive, and now where there is no such thing as chronic and aggressive perio, now we just categorize them as perio, and then we stage and grade, or as necrotizing uh, periodontal disease, or periodontitis as a manifestation of systemic disease. This, this systemic disease, by the way, it's like if someone has diabetes, for example. Diabetes is a systemic disease. Systemic means something happening inside your body. So someone who has uncontrolled diabetes, someone who's not taking care of their diabetic conditions, so they're not exercising, not taking medications, not watching their diet, and they have perio, you would put them in this category. So let's look at uh, some images first. 
when you look at this, I'm hoping you see health because it's coral pink, it's nice and tight. I don't think I would see any bleeding if I were to probe. This is someone who has periodontal health on an intact periodontium. Why intact? Intact periodontium, there's no recession. There is no bone loss. Hence, this is the perfect perio client, uh, the perfect health, healthy client. Periodontal health on an intact periodontium. Look at this one. So this is periodontal health on a reduced periodontium in a non-perio client, in a non-periodontal client. So if you look at the gums on the top, for example, on the max, it, it is fairly healthy. There's no bleeding. Let's say when I probe here, I see no bleeding. The gums may not be perfect coral pink um, color, but it comes close. So why is this considered a reduced periodontium? It's reduced because there's recession. Okay, what do you think could have caused this recession? Aggressive brushing, possibly. Aggressive brushing, um, sometimes ortho, uh, can cause recession. So this is, if you look at the bone loss, there's no bone loss. Okay, so this, when you check for bone loss, the way to check, actually, I can even use the previous example to um, show you. So if I look at the previous radiograph, for example, you look for the CEJ. And I didn't do a good job, but it should be two millimeters. The bone and health is two millimeters apical or two millimeters below the CEJ. So if I look over here, here is the CEJ. You know, the bone is roughly two millimeters from the CEJ. So that's normal. So it's healthy. Okay, this person has intact bone. So periodontal health on a reduced periodontium, reduced periodontium because there is recession in a non perio client, in a client that doesn't have bone loss. So that you would put them in a healthy category, periodontal health, but they have a reduced periodontium. This one is someone who is healthy again, healthy gums, coral pink color, no bleeding. It says periodontal health on a reduced periodontium, reduced because we see recession in a successfully treated stable periodontitis client. So there is bone loss, as you see. Remember the CEJ is right here and the bone level is here. So there is, you know, it's way more than two millimeters. So there is significant bone loss, but this bone level has been stable for several years. So if I had looked at his previous radiograph, I would have noticed that their bone level stays in this area for several years. So he has been successfully treated in perio. Reduced perio though, because there is recession, but now healthy, no bleeding. So that's, those are the categories you get from periodontal health. Then we have dental biofilm induced gingivitis or plaque induced gingivitis. Biofilm plaque, same thing. And what is this? This is inflammation. The gums are inflamed and only the gums are inflamed. Remember, itis means inflammation. So inflammation of what? Inflammation of the gum, of the gingiva. So we can see lots of inflammation, lots of plaque. Uh, I bet you would be bleeding on probing. But the nice part about this is that it is reversible. If we teach them how to do proper oral hygiene and if they do a good job with brushing, flossing, and coming to see us regularly for debridement, they, we can return them back to, they could be returned back to uh, good oral health. Now, it does say systemic modifying factors. And what the systemic modifying factors refers to is that sometimes when people are going through puberty or menstruation um, or pregnancy or if they're even taking like birth control pills, it can affect the gum. So even if you have very little plaque, because they're going through puberty or because they're going through pregnancy, it can become aggravated. The gums can become a little bit more infected. So that's what the systemic modifying factors uh, refer to. Is sometimes puberty, sometimes menstruation can affect the gums. Sometimes um, malnutrition can affect the, game, the gum. Sometimes leukemia, which is a type of cancer, the blood um, can affect. So there are systemic body conditions that can, you know, play around with the gingival condition. Stable attachment levels, which means there is no cal, um, no no cal that that the cal would be for perio, and there's no cal for for perio, and it's only because of plaque. Plaque is causing the inflammation. Nothing else. So look at this one, plaque-induced gingivitis on an intact periodontum. So we do see bleeding, I do see puffy gums. This is like bulbous gums maybe perhaps, right? It's protruding outward. Um, I'm trying to see if there's any festoons you might wanna call, I don't know. Um, it's like a lifesaver around the tooth. But there is inflammation of the gums. 
and there's bleeding. But if you look at the radiograph, no bone loss, right? And one way to tell for bone loss is if you look at the, the cortical bone or this area here, it's nice and flat. If it looks a little fuzzy, um, this one is starting to look a little fuzzy, but if you start to see fuzziness, it would mean that they have early bone loss and they, we don't really see any fuzziness here. So this is um, intact perio, no bone loss, but plaque induced gingivitis. So if you look over here, it says, um, if you're ever unsure if it's healthy or gingivitis, one thing you wanna check for is, you should make sure to have no cows. You should make sure to have, um, when you look at the pro uh, probing depths or pocket depths, it should be three millimeters or less for health and for gingivitis. The bleeding on probing is your main indicator here. So if it's less than 10% bleeding, it will be considered healthy, but in this case, I'm definitely sure or positive that it's more than 10% just by looking at the tissues I can tell that it's inflamed so it's more than 10% bleeding hence gingivitis and there's no bone loss for either health or gingivitis because we know with gingivitis no bone loss but let's look at this picture we see recession here and we see bleeding but if you look at the radiograph, no bone loss. Bone level is intact. Remember, two millimeters from the CEJ. It's intact. So the reason why there's recession here is because of ortho. In this case, this is because of ortho. And um, this person is put into the category plaque-induced gingivitis, so inflammation of the gum because of plaque, on a reduced periodontium, reduced because there is recession, in a non-perio client. Non-perio because there is no bone loss. Now notice over here it says there is attachment loss. When we say there's cal, this cal is just recession. This cal, when you say cal of you know one or two millimeters, when we're looking at cal, um, you know you might automatically think, oh my god, cal means perio. This person has perio, um, but not necessarily. Sometimes there is cal because of these recession, and those recession is are there not because of per, uh, perio. It's there because of ortho or because of aggressive brushing. So it's not a true cal, if you will. So yes, you can see attachment loss. You can see cal because there's recession, but that doesn't mean they have perio. Because in this case, this is. They do have cal as we see here, but they're considered gingivitis because they have intact bone look at this one we see bleeding so there's definitely gingivitis and i bet you the bleeding is more than 10 percent hence gingivitis there is attachment loss because there is recession as we see you can see the change in color this is where the cej is and you can see there is gum recession and we also see bone loss the bone level should be just two millimeters below cej and it's further down so we're seeing bone loss we're seeing BOP, we're seeing pocket depths of three millimeter or less. Okay, so anytime you have a four millimeter pocket, we're automatically going to consider it a perio client unless it's a pseudo pocket, which is like a pocket that's really inflamed um, due to gingivitis. And there's cal. So this person is gingivitis on a reduced periodontum, reduced because there's recession, in a successfully treated perio client because successfully treated because this client, this uh, person, or clients rather, bone level has been stable for a very long time. For like five years, the bone level has been stable and it hasn't progressed. So that's why we're saying successfully treated because we have access to his previous radiographs and we notice that it has not um, progressed. So what we looked at before was all um, examples of gingivitis due to plaque, so plaque-induced gingivitis. Now let's look at non-dental biofilm-induced. And what that essentially means is that there is something wrong in the gum that has nothing to do with plaque, that has nothing to do with biofilm. And if you look at the next list, you'll see that there's so many different categories within the non-plaque-induced gingival disease or within the non-dental biofilm-induced gingival disease. And again, all of these conditions like fungal, viral, if you have infections of the mouth, that is due to viral or due to fungal or due to bacterial that has nothing, not the bacteria for plaque, but other types of bacteria, they fall under the non-plaque induced gingival diseases. And I'm going to give you some examples. Here's like another slide. And it tells you, like you could, they could have any of these conditions. And if they have any of these conditions, like even if it's just like a chemical burn, for example, or like you burned your palate, for example, we're going to say that they fall, that person has a non-plaque induced gingival disease or condition. So let's look at some examples. 
genetic. Okay, so one of the um, things that fall under non-plaque induced gingival disease is genetic. And an example of a genetic or developmental origin is hereditary gingival fibromatosis. This is a genetic condition. It's rare, but it's genetic. And sometimes if you have this, this is due to a hereditary condition. This inflammation is not due to plaque. Really important. Not due to plaque, due to a hereditary condition. And because it's not due to plaque, it is considered a non-plaque induced gingival disease. Let's look at another one. So another category within non-plaque induced was specific infections. So maybe they have this bacteria that causes the eating away of the gums. And so that's necrotizing gingivitis. This bacteria that's causing this eating away of the gums has nothing to do with plaque bacteria. It's a completely different bacteria. And so therefore it falls under the specific infection category. Sometimes people have this lesion in the mouth, and this lesion in the mouth is called atypical mycobacterial infection. It's a bacterial infection, but that bacteria is very different from plaque. So again, you're seeing a lesion that has nothing to do with plaque, so this falls under non-plaque-induced gingival condition. You could even have um, a viral origin, so like primary herpetic gingival stomatitis. This is like cold sores. Cold sores come from herpes simplex virus 1. And when you look at the cold sores, what you can see is that um, there's like cold sores on the inside as opposed to the outside. It affects the infants and the young children, can affect young adults. I had this once, very painful. This is a kid who has it. A young child is very, very painful. Here's another example. So again, these are viral infections, not bacterial, like plaque-induced um, conditions. So they all fall under the non-plaque-induced category. Here's fungal, so we can see you know, um, a redness here, candidiasis. There's also an inflammatory and immune condition and lesion that falls under the non-plaque-induced um, category. And what you'll notice over here is that sometimes if you have an allergic reaction to a toothpaste, like cinnamon, for example, is a, is a very common ingredient. Actually, I have that slide. Cinnamon is a very common um, ingredient that can cause allergies. And so that intense redness that you see, is that because of plaque? No, right? It's because of an allergic reaction to toothpaste, not because of plaque. So where does this fall under? Does this fall under plaque-induced gingivitis or non- um, uh, plaque-induced gingival disease. It falls under non-plaque-induced because the redness has nothing to do with plaque. You can see here, we see some more conditions, erythema multiform. We can see lichen planus, which is an autoimmune disease. And you can see this um, white, it looks like a plant. Um, and it has striations, which is known as Wickham striae. Sometimes you can get a reactive process or reaction to something. So for example, uh, let's see here. <clears throat> we can get like a reaction to, um, this is actually pregnancy. So pregnancy caused a reaction. This is, um, sorry, this one is pyogenic granuloma due to pregnancy. This is peripheral giant cell granuloma. So it's a reaction to something. There's also neoplasms as well. I'm going to see if I can change this a little. Here we go. Okay, so with neoplasms, you can have like a cancerous lesion. I don't know why this keeps jumping back and forth, but you could have a cancerous lesion and when and they would fall under the neoplasms, which are non-dental biofilm and juice. And so again, you might see, you know, something wrong with the gums, but that has nothing to do with plaque. It's because of possibly a cancer. There's also uh, nutritional deficiencies like this. So vitamin C deficiency that can cause these conditions. Traumatic lesions as well can cause, um, you know, you can see something wrong with the gums, but again, they have nothing to do with plaque, so they fall under the non-dental biofilm-induced category. This is an aspirin burn, which is a chemical injury, and we also have examples of a thermal burn. So if someone burnt, I mean, how many times have we taken um, a sip of very hot coffee or a bite of pizza that's really hot and you burnt your palate? They all fall under the non-dental biofilm-induced category. Oh, and the last one I forgot is the pigmentation. So gingival pigmentation. Now, I know when we think of pigmentation, we might think of, you know, someone who's dark skin would have pigmentation of the gums, but this is a different pigmentation. Pigmentation could be an amalgam tattoo, 
Pigmentation could be a smoker's melanosa, so people who are smoking can develop this pigmentation due to tobacco use. And pigmentation could also be because of a, um, a drug like minocycline, which is a drug this, so that someone took. This was before, this is after, and they developed a pigment a gray-blue color of the gum tissue, which was a side effect. Yeah. So many um, different examples of um, non-dental biofilm plaque-induced, sorry, non-dental biofilm in gingival diseases, which means that all these pictures that we just looked at have nothing, nothing to do with plaque. Hence, they fall under this category.